Now, I am very aware that most of the viewers on this channel are watching for the GRE, but I thought I would do a GMAT focus video just for those students who are studying for that exam. So data sufficiency is a topic that only comes up in the GMAT and not the GRE. Of course, you can watch it for fun anyway if you're studying any exam, but this is targeted at those who are prepping for the GMAT. And what I thought I would do is make a video that gets to the heart of understanding data sufficiency, but it's just intended to help you understand what they are asking you, because that's the number one obstacle for most students. What are they even asking me, especially at the start? I also wanted to cover in the same video some of my favorite habits and philosophies that relate to data sufficiency. Because I am a big believer that if you understand and grapple with the core of what data sufficiency is, you can master it much more quickly. The question on screen gets to the heart of what data sufficiency is about. The lessons that I want you to take from this question are in blue below. But first, let's read the question. Is the integer x a prime number? And then we have the two statements. First lesson that I want to get across is that it's not about getting one single answer, it's about getting consistent answers. For example, looking at statement one, we know x is an integer and we know it's between six and 10. So x has to be seven, eight or nine. That doesn't mean automatically that that statement is insufficient. Just because there are three different options doesn't mean it's insufficient. If all of those three options or values were giving us a consistent answer to the question, is X a prime number, it would be sufficient. Unfortunately, they are not giving consistent answers. If X was seven, then it would be a prime number. But if X was eight or nine, it wouldn't be a prime number. Prime number, I've done a separate video on that. It's just a number that can't be divided by anything except itself and one. You should memorize the first 10 prime numbers. Anyway, we don't have a consistent answer here. Sometimes X is a prime number, like with seven. Sometimes it's not, like with eight or nine. So this statement is insufficient. But it's not insufficient because there are three answers. If all three answers were prime, three, five, and seven, then it would be sufficient. It's all about consistent answers. That's what leads to a statement being sufficient. Let's look at statement two. X is between seven and 11, not including seven or 11 because of the inequality sign. And we know it's an integer. What do you think about that statement? If you want to pause the video and think about it. The options that statement two gives us would be eight, nine, or 10. Now, just because there are three different answers doesn't mean the statement is automatically insufficient. In fact, here, the answer is sufficient. Eight, nine, and 10 are all non-prime numbers. None of them are prime numbers. Now, the second thing you might be thinking is, Oh, but that leads to an answer of no. The question is, is the integer x a prime number? And statement two would tell us that x definitely is not. Therefore, the statement is insufficient. That's the second lesson I want you to take from this video. We don't care whether the answer is yes or no. We just care about consistency. Statement two gives us a consistent answer. The x is not prime. Therefore, statement two is sufficient, and the answer would be B. Statement two alone is sufficient, but statement one alone is not sufficient. I don't care if the answer happens to be no, no, X is not a prime number, or yes, X is a prime number. I'm just looking for a consistent answer. Contradictory answers, as in statement one, mean insufficient. Consistent answers, as in statement two, means sufficient, regardless of whether the answer is no or yes. And that 
covers two of the core fallacies I see all the time with students trying to understand data sufficiency. I could just end the video there because that's such an important set of lessons, but I thought I would give you two more quick tips about data sufficiency. If this video gets enough comments and likes, I'll do more about data sufficiency. Otherwise, I'll go back to topics that cover both GRE and GMAT. Anyway, next one. Here is an official MBA.com question. And the lesson here, I've often said over many years, conquer the question before you reach the statements. Or in simpler language, simplify the question. I see many students who would get a question like this, does 2n minus 3n equal zero? And then they'd look straight to the statements and they'd try and answer, they'd maybe pick some numbers. They would maybe get a little bit confused by statement two because it's algebra and they wouldn't know what to do. But the problem there is that they're not reworking the question. This should be a top priority of yours if possible, and it usually is possible, to rework or simplify the question, be it algebra, inequalities, or even word questions, so that you're ready for the statements. Don't rush into reading the statements, rework the question. For this question, that minus and then equaling zero is just a little bit confusing to me. It would be neater for me if I added 3n to both sides and that would give us 2m equals 3n question mark. It's quite important to keep the question mark because remember, we don't know that 2m equals 3n. That's just what the question is asking us. Now, because we've reworked the question, we've simplified it slightly, we can maybe spot which statement is sufficient. m not equaling zero doesn't tell us if 2m equals 3n. First of all, it doesn't tell us anything about n. So that statement's out. But now the second statement looks much more promising. They tell us that 6m equals 9n. So we can just divide both sides by 3 and get 2m equals 3n, answering the question that we had simplified. No need to sub things in or do anything crazy like that, pick numbers. We just rework the question, make it an easier sounding question, and then look through the statements. Two key lessons there. First, always rework the question. And second, and this does come up a fair bit, if you have an equation or an inequality next to a question mark, as in we don't know this for sure, keep the question mark. Don't just write 2m equals 3n, because then your brain will be tricked into thinking that we know that for sure. Actually, that's the question that we're trying to find the answer to. Keep the question mark. I tell that to a lot of students. Not many remember to do it, but those that do invariably end up doing better. Anyway, time for my final tip with data sufficiency. This is arguably one of the biggest, but there are always trap answers with data sufficiency. The GMAT examiners are much harsher, I think, than the GRE ones, because this whole data sufficiency section, which comprises a third of all the questions in quant, is designed to lead you towards one particular trap answer. There will invariably be one wrong answer that like half or 70% of students go for. For example, in this question, if both x and y are non-zero numbers, what is the value of y of x? And then we see that x equals 6. And no one's really going to be fooled by that. Maybe 1%, 2%, 3% of students would pick that as being sufficient. Because it's like, okay, x is 6, but we don't know what y is, so insufficient. That's not the wrong answer that everyone will gravitate towards. There is another wrong answer that people will go for. If you want, you can pause the video, try and answer it yourself, or I will show you the trap. The trap here is with statement two. 
Many people will think if y squared equals x squared, that basically means that y equals x. And if y equals x, y over x will be like y over itself, y over y, which is just one. And then they'll go, boom, statement two is sufficient. That is the trap answer. And that's the one many, many students will pick. They've set things up nice and neatly. They didn't just write y equals x, because that would be a bit too obvious, but they just kind of pushed one answer gently towards you and kind of nodded at it and gone like, please, please pick this. Because look, y squared equals x squared. So they're the same thing, right? So it's y over x is just one. They're desperate for you to pick statement two. What's the problem with statement two? If y squared equals x squared, that does not mean that y equals x. y could equal plus or minus x. For example, 2 squared is equal to minus 2 squared. That means that y doesn't necessarily equal x. And notice the question never said, and it's always good to check, that x and y are both positive. It just said non-zero. And if y was 2, and x was minus 2, which is possible from statement 2, then 2 over minus 2 from the question would be minus 1. So we don't always get 1 just because y squared equals x squared and we have y over x. We might get minus 1 if they're the same number but with a different sign. Now that we've spotted that trap, we can confidently move on and see what the correct answer is. Okay, if we have both statements together, we know x is 6, we know x is positive, so x squared is 36, but we still don't know if y is 6 or minus 6. We know it's got to be one of those two, because when we square it, we've got to equal 36, but we still don't know if y is positive or negative. So we don't know if y over x will be 1, if it's 6 and 6, or minus 1, if it's minus 6 and 6. So the answer would actually be E, same as one and two together are not sufficient. And the way that you are gonna spot these kinds of traps are to know going into the data sufficiency question that there will be a trap answer. If you go in there with that kind of paranoia, knowing that they are pushing one answer on you, then you're much more prepared. A maxim that I live by is that if you haven't spotted the trap answer, you've fallen for the trap. So remember, data sufficiency always carries one trap answer. Don't fall for it, spot the trap. Don't go for the obvious answer that you could spot within like 10, 20 seconds. Think about it, meditate a little bit, put the pen down. You rarely need to write much down with data sufficiency. Instead, you need to think. I always believe that Data sufficiency is like the sister section to critical reasoning. They're testing your reasoning much more than your problem solving. That's for the rest of the quant section. Anyway, I hope these three tips, it's probably more like eight tips, who knows, but I hope all these tips help you understand data sufficiency and appreciate its nuances. Anyway, if you learn anything from this video, please do leave a like, leave a comment, it's much appreciated. Thank you as always for watching and see you in the next video.